uh, the, the solutions should be posted by probably noon today. Uh, now assignment two, some of you did turn in a uh, little late, so I haven't uh, finished grading them, but uh, uh, I'm hoping uh, I'll return them to you uh, on Tuesday next week, uh, and the solutions will also be up there. Um, so before I uh, start the new topic today, uh, I just wanted to summarize what we have done till now. Uh, and uh, just to kind of uh, um, calibrate ourselves uh, of what uh, are we able to uh, do uh, with the material that uh, uh, has been uh, discussed. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, what we did in the beginning of the course was um, by drawing analogies to classical mechanics, uh, um, started asking questions like uh, how would uh, particles move in response to forces uh, in, in, uh, uh, if, if they have, uh, um, you know, if they are small enough and follow quantum mechanics actually, right? So, uh, so from Schrodinger equation, we are able to write down the expression. We realized that the state of a system is represented by the wave function and uh, from the wave function uh, uh, of an electron be it in a free free state or in some potential wells or in a crystal we can find out what are the energies that are allowed for it and uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the name of the game there was uh, 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 after you find out what are the energies versus the momentum allowed for an electron right uh, we kind of declare victory, say we, we now know what to do in transport because uh, if I know my energy versus K diagram, uh, I know the velocities of each of the states, the group velocities, uh, uh, and I can use that, right? I can use this now to uh, uh, write down an expression for the current, which uh, manifestly is, you know, it, it accounts for the fact that these are quantum mechanical particles and you know it has wave particle duality uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so so for example the charge current uh, we wrote uh, for any dimensions uh, as uh, essentially the group velocity of each state times the occupation function of that state uh, is the uh, so that's the current due to each k state and then the total current will be just that right and so that's kind of a summary of what we have done till now and now this, I must say, uh, in, uh, in some transport courses, uh, you can kind of spend the whole semester getting here and then apply it to many situations, right? And you have already started applying it. For example, using this picture, we are able to calculate uh, how uh, a transistor should perform, right? And then uh, uh, basically, uh, we immediately are asking the question, how do, how do things look in the case space? Right? We're, we're kind of not looking so much in the real space. You go to the case space and looking at how are the occupation functions. We, I did emphasize quite a bit that pretty much you know, all useful devices, you're playing with this function, the, the occupation function. And there's always a difference in agenda between contacts that are driving the flow of the current here. Right? So source and drain, gate, all of them are trying, vying for, for a part of this. Uh, you know, control and and uh, based on that, you, by control, as it switches the control from one to another, the the device performs in a certain way. Right? So, uh, and uh, so we talked about transistors. So in general, any situation you solve an assignment problem uh, in the second assignment where there is a metal insulator metal junction like this, right? And uh, uh, or we s you solve the transistor problem with source drain and gate, uh, you solved a short key barrier, right, where you have a metal and a semiconductor and the electrons are incident perhaps on, from this side. Right? So all different ways of solving the same problem really, right? And the one thing that we should add here to keep in general, you know, the most general situation is the transmission probability for electron to go across any barriers. Right? So, so once we add that, for example here, if I were to sketch the transmission probability uh, this is the conduction band edge, and then you have a gap, right? So that means these energies are not allowed, right? 
is the band gap of the semiconductor, and this is the conduction band edge. So electrons are coming along from here, and they see, see this barrier, right? So now if I were to plot the transmission probability, and you wrote a program in your second assignment which kind of deals with that. Right? There it was kind of discrete meaning steps, but once you make the steps small enough, you can model any profile, right? Right, uh, and, and uh, so the so transmission probability here, uh, I think, you know, without just intuitively you can write that there's no barrier for these electrons, so the transmission probability should be close to one, and then, you know, it should kind of decay uh, exponentially as you go down because it's a tunneling process be below that, right? Similarly, here, uh, the transmission probability for the tunnel junction uh, is, uh, uh, so, so this is your transmission probability, and then, and then you always have the energy window within which the you know, the, the source drain voltage or the difference of the voltage. So transmission probability times a certain energy window, the product of the two will, you know, the area under the curve, uh, and basically these carriers are the ones that actually carry the current, right? So, uh, not, not this one here, for example. So for example, here the energy window is just this window here, right? At low temperatures. At high temperatures, there'll be a little tail of the Fermi Dirac carriers here, right? But again, the transmission probability, if I were to sketch it, would be kind of high over the barrier, and then it'll go down, maybe, you know, go down a little less, and then drop even sharply here, right? And then so there'll be very low probability here, but then there's a lot of electrons. The product trans tells you the current, total current. So in a very similar way, what we have neglected in our ballistic transistor picture is we said that the transmission probability, you know, only over the barrier. In very, very small transistors today, there is also a direct tunneling current that goes kind of through the barrier down. Right? And that becomes a bit of a problem when your source and drain are very close because this barrier is thinner as you make it smaller and smaller. So that is a bit of an issue in, in some semiconductors uh, and then people are, you know, one has to design the device accordingly, you know, to avoid this little tunneling part of it. You know, so. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, this sort of picture uh, works for. Uh, uh, so, and what we have done till now is we have always exclusively talked about ballistic transport, where there is no sc microscopic scattering, meaning if I populate, if if my source populates this state, source formula level is here, it populates this state, then that electron is as if in, it's a one-lane highway, and there is nothing else to scatter it. it, it you know, it's going at that speed all through the crystal till it kind of reaches the other end. You know. Does that make sense? It's a ballistic transport. But uh, uh, we know that in a crystal there may be defects and other things that will scatter it, meaning that electron stays in this state for a certain time. And after that time, it may scatter, lose a little energy, collide with the lattice or a defect or something like that. And it may actually not be in this state forever. You know. If your crystal was absolutely perfect and you did not allow phonon scattering, then this is indeed an eigenstate and a stationary state. So the electron should stay here forever. Right? But in reality, it's sitting in a thermal bath because the lattice is, you know, the electron will collide with the lattice sooner or later. And then the phonon bath is, you know, uh, it's an infinite sink in, in some sense. It can, you know, it, you can always set off the vibrations, right? Just like if you excite an electron in a hydrogen atom, uh, it will, ultimately emit light, it will lose that energy and emit, emit it as light. In the same way, here it will emit a phonon and emit heat. So today, uh, the new topic we're gonna start is look at, look at that microscopic process. If I populate a state, how long is it gonna stay there? You know? And that's uh, a time-dependent perturbation theory. We're gonna basically derive the central result, which is the Fermi golden rule, and then start applying it to a few situations to see what sort of lifetimes are we talking about, and how do we use it to estimate you know, transport properties, conductivity, and then from there we'll connect it to Boltzmann transport and see how you know, all the transport parameters that convert a voltage to current or a heat to current like a thermoelectric or photoelectric, all these things come out of there. You know? Seebeck coefficients, all that stuff just comes out from there. So we'll look into that. But just to, I want to emphasize again that uh, what we have developed till now you can use it to solve a great variety of problems in transport. You know? So two terminal diodes, tunnel junctions, metal insulator, metal tunnel junctions, transistors, all kinds of stuff, you know? so just by this formalism. Yeah. 
And uh, for the uh, uh, just I, I, I uh, so in the second assignment you uh, did, I think uh, um, I just wanted to kind of say that uh, uh, you, you you I can if you want I can also post for example for the ballistic fed this is a mathematical code some I mean some of you use other software to co code it up to solve the transcendental equations uh, but uh, uh, the thing I wanted to kind of mention so you, you can set it up in you know it's not the cleanest way but at least uh, you can set up to solve the you know roots of this kind of equation that we I emphasize is a important equation that controls the carrier density of a semiconductor transistor as a function of the gate voltage. And what I wanted to emphasize is this log scale. In many um, books, you may see uh, only two approximations. Uh, when it's, you know, the dashed line here. So this is essentially a Fermi Dirac integral. And uh, at the high, you know, uh, gate voltages, you get one approximation of the Fermi Dirac integral. At the low gate voltage, you get a Maxwell Boltzmann approximation. And in some books, you would either see this one and that one, but maybe not the full expression. So I just want to, we, have, we have dealt with the full, full blown expression and not made any approximations there. Okay? And similarly, uh, so that's the Fermi Dirac integral. And, and uh, as far as the current goes, I just wanted to kind of make sure that, uh, almost, you know, repeat it if I haven't done it enough times already, is you know, any given semiconductor, now you should be able to you know, essentially calculate what should the ultimate device characteristics look like, you know. For if, if you give me molysulfide, you know, and, and uh, all that you, uh, and, and you say, well, I'm going to make, I found it, discovered a new two-dimensional material, how good, how good can it be, you know, as a ballistic transistor? So you can just plug and play, pl plug in that value, you know, uh, and uh, the, the current expressions we derived and calculate all these things. Right? That makes sense, and, and then from there you can predict uh, the dependence on effective mass of the bands, the dependence on valleys, all that stuff just comes out from there. So, yeah. okay. there are, there's another way to look at it, that this is one way of asking the question that I have found a semiconductor, what is the performance? The other way is I want this performance, what semiconductor or what material should I choose? So that's a bottom-up approach. Say I, I want this, what atoms combination or what band structure will give me? So it's the inverse problem. That so that's also an interesting problem, and I, I think some of you have chosen that as a project and uh, yeah, as for the course, and we'll we'll see you know what what uh, what sort of things can one answer from that perspective. So, right meaning, you 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 don't want this curve. Maybe you want slightly different stuff. Maybe there's a you want a you know negative differential relation, something like that. What should you do to the band structure back there? So it's the inverse problem. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, I, I should say that this is the ballistic limit. In, in, and today, what we are going to start is, is uh, uh, answering the question as to what would happen as channels become longer and you allow scattering and things like that. Okay. Um, uh, also, I wanted to uh, make sure that we are realistic in saying if I look at the current density in milliamp or micron in a transistor. Uh, there is, uh, so if you do the numbers, you get, you know, two to three milliamp per micron for a certain gate overdrive voltages. But uh, by the time you reach about three, four milliamp per micron, uh, what happens is the outside resistances, parasitic resistances kick in, and they limit the current. They, you can't, they clamp down, and, and, and uh, in any transistor, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I look at the transistor, there is an internal part of the transistor, but then there are these series resistances from source or drain, you know. Uh, and and this uh, series resistances, e external part of it, uh, um, are also limited by quantized conductance. You, know, you can't get more than a quantum of conductance for any number of each mode. And so the uh, series conductances are also limited, I, I think shown earlier, and that kind of l limits how much current you actually get in the ballistic fed. So, uh, and uh, after we are done with this mi microscopic, you know, the golden rule sort of picture, we'll come back to this and see that this, we will absorb these external things into this full thing as one device now. And then that will lead us to this uh, kind of the non-equilibrium Green's function idea. And then, you know, how, how do you consider 
the external part of it also as a part, you know, we basically will include all of this into one Hamiltonian and solve the whole thing, you know, as, as a full blown. Uh, so we'll see that that will uh, teach us a few new things, you know, so, so a few new things once we do that. Okay, so uh, uh, a couple of comments also about the assignment problems. Uh, so I handed it out, uh, sorry, first assignment, I hopefully you uh, received it. Uh, and uh, what I was going to do is post the solution sometime later today. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd say that, uh, so I was reasonably happy with, uh, one of the questions was an open-ended question, the electron in a cone and all that. And uh, uh, I'll, uh, I think there were two or three different approaches, which was interesting. I mean, one of the, uh, uh, so I'll post it, have a look at it. Uh, I was initially thinking whether I should ask you to grade your own assignments because that way at least you will look at the solutions, right? Or your force. <laughs> but uh, I, anyway, I did it this time. And uh, please look at the solutions too and compare and, you know, because there may be approaches that are not necessarily exactly what you have done. So. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, start now uh, today with uh, um, oh, yeah, before I forget, uh, I have also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, posted this uh, set of potential project uh, uh, topics. Uh, so please uh, consider, you know, start thinking, not saying, I mean, I really like you to come and talk to me about what you want to do, uh, you know, uh, choose. A, this is not exhaustive. If you have something that you have in mind, you can, you know, definitely choose that and we can discuss and finalize something. But it's important to choose and choose something and get going you know, because we are halfway through the semester now. So, yeah. And, and the topic I'm covering today, I've written this up uh, again in this handout number 14, page uh, 100 something, 139. So, you know, I'm going to follow that at least in the derivation part. And then we are going to take it over and apply it to many different areas now. Okay, so, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, let's start with this uh, problem of, uh, uh, you know, we, we pull out this ballistic approximation from this problem and say that now I'm going to allow for uh, scattering of these quantum mechanical states into which I, you know, put the electrons, uh, whether they are in a crystal or any situation, the result that we are going to first derive is extremely general uh, and uh, it was uh, really derived for atomic transitions initially, uh, not necessarily semiconductor transport. but it's used uh, heavily in semiconductor transport today. Okay. So here's, here's uh, uh, I'll, I'll first uh, just set up this question in this form, that I have uh, a, an electron in, that has two possible eigenstates. The, these two could be, for example, in a quantum dot, there are two states in the conduction band, let's say, as an example. It could be two states in the conduction band of a quantum dot, which is confined in all three directions, right? The atomic-like states, and uh, at time, T is equal to zero and all times before that, uh, it was sitting in the ground state. The electron is sitting in the ground state, so the system is in the ground state. And at time T is equal to zero, I turn on a potential, some sort of a potential. It could be uh, maybe an electric field, uh, which, uh, um, you know, which, which, or it could be a, that atom, I, I make it, I radiate it with photons or something like that. I turn something on, right? Which is an electric potential, and the electron sees that potential through a Lorentz sort of force. It's, it picks that up. Well, now I'm being perturbed. So uh, now the question is, uh, uh, how long? The question is uh, really, what happens at all future times? You know, that's really the question we want to answer. What happens at all future times uh, from from the moment I turn on this perturbation? So uh, if the perturbation is constant in time, you know, it's, it, it's, it may vary in space, it may vary, it may be oscillating, but if it's constant in time, then this answer is exactly solvable problem, meaning you can, and, and uh, remember to solve this problem, you have to go back to your time dependent Schrodinger equation and solve it, you know, here with a, additional potential and the potential is just W. Right? in the time-dependent perturbation, uh, sorry, in the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So let's write that down. Uh, so our time-dependent. So, uh, 
So I'm going to write it as a state vector psi. You know? So and I think you understand that if I take an inner product with x, I get psi of x and all that sort of thing. This is a state vector. You want to think of it that way. And uh, what we are saying is initially the electron was sitting in the ground state. Maybe it was in a uh, maybe it was in a uh, you know ground state of a hydrogen atom. You know, and uh, sorry. Let's picture it a little better. So let's say it is the ground state of a hydrogen atom, and the potential looks something like that. Here's the ground state. Call it one, and this is what, what did I call one or zero? Okay, one. Good. E one, and this is E two, and then you have all these other states of the hydrogen atom, and then you finally have vacuum there. Right? And we're saying the electron is sitting in the ground state. So that's t is equal to zero. And that means that uh, you, with the moment I write it like that, I already have you know, my original Hamiltonian. How does it look like? Well, it looks like p squared by 2m of the electron uh, minus e squared by 4 pi epsilon naught r, all that stuff. I mean, we have solved this whole problem already. You know. Does that make sense? I mean, so I've already solved it, and here are the solutions. Okay, so it's sitting there. So now I have an additional potential because I have a a, a photon incident on, on this thing now, right? And that additional potential is an additional W now, right? So in addition to your steady state Coulomb potential that the proton exerts on the electron, now you have this additional thing. It's coming in, and this could be an electromagnetic wave, in which case, you know, it will be an oscillating ele electric and a, uh, <laughs> yeah, electric field E cross H, okay, so E and H. Anyway, so, so it, it will be an oscillating electric field. And uh, you can take electric field, and uh, if you, this is just an example. If you take your electric field, E dot R, that's a potential, W of R. Right? So e, e, integral of E dx is a potential, right? dr that's the potential right uh, so I'm just uh, kind of motivating it uh, so we are saying that now we change it to h0 plus w and what happens to this state that that's really the question okay, so, yeah um, we are going to make it time dependent at this point let's assume it's not time dependent let's say it's a standing wave you know which is, so it's uh, or 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 you know, maybe maybe let's let's simplify it further. I, I put the hydrogen atom between two, you know, uh, big metal plates and apply a voltage across it, a constant voltage. I hold it constant. In which case, now there is just a constant electric field across it. And uh, experimentally, uh, what will happen is if I apply a very large electric field, uh, this electron will be stripped out, and that's called field ionization. I mean, the electron will be pulled out of the hydrogen atom and you will create a plasma in there and the electron will go and hit the anode and the proton will be slower but it will go and hit the cathode so it's a plasma ionization in fact it's used to create vacuum you know it's called the iron pump you just have very large electrodes if there's any atoms floating in between it will strip out an electron and then the you know they collide with the cathodes and then you have removed that atom in, in the vacuum so you can you know remove the atoms from there so uh, that's uh, going, uh, you know, a little bit in another direction. So the question really is, uh, how long will it stay here? And uh, so here, in this problem, for a two-level system, it's actually a. Uh, um, so the way you solve it is, say, I have two levels, and my whole world that the electron sees is confined to this two level. It's never, never. Exact, because it's an approximation. Any two-level system is an pro approximation. That electron could easily be in vacuum, in which case it has a continuum of infinite number of levels allowed to it. But if, if this is my whole system, if I model it in this way, and these energies are far away, and we are not accessing it with our, you know, whatever perturbation we're doing, uh, in that case, uh, a two-level system, any state of the system uh, at any time may be written as a certain constant C1, a coefficient C1 of t, times 1 plus C2 of t times 2. Right? This covers all possibilities of a two-level system. Right? These, are two const these are two coefficients that may vary with time. Right? And the probability of finding it in state 1 is C1 of t mod squared. 
and probability of finding it in state two is C2 of t mod squared. This is a very simple picture, right? And what I'm trying to say is uh, you can write this uh, as a differential, time dependent differential equation now. And uh, uh, the way you would write it is uh, you can write it as a column vector with the two coefficients. Right. Let me just write it down first and hopefully uh, it will be clear what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm saying my state vector psi. See, these two are, we know what they are. They are the eigenfunctions, right? So they're not changing whether you apply external field or perturbation, they're not changing. The eigenfunctions remain similar. What I'm really interested in, what are these two? I'm saying that my initial condition is that time t is equal to zero, this is one and that is zero. Right? So, so, so state one is occupied, state two is unoccupied. So I, I, instead of writing, uh, I can also represent this state simply by writing the two coefficients in a column vector. This is the state vector, uh, you know, it represents the system. And now actually I have two couple differential equations, two Schrodinger equations, if you might. Uh, so rate, this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation, d over dt of psi is equal to h psi. That, that's really what we are after. You know, so, yeah. and, and here, uh, uh, the, uh, if I had no perturbation, then you know, st the stationary state picture tells me that you know, if I had uh, uh, state C1, if the electron was in state C1, it has an energy of E1. I can kind of write it down without, you know, uh, and if it was in state two, it will stay in state two, right, if there was no perturbation. So those are the diagonal elements, and this is your unperturbed uh, Schrodinger equation solution. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, this is saying that you can uh, take your time. If you did not have this, that's your equation, right? And the off-diagonal terms are zero. You have two decoupled equations. They are orthogonal, they don't talk to each other, right? The moment you apply a perturbation, you will fill these and it will couple the two now, right? So it will make it possible for state one to end up in state two or state two to end up in state one. And those will be matrix elements essentially uh, of whatever perturbation you apply uh, and you know, between state one and state two. You can, uh, at this point, we're just gonna call it W12. <coughs> and W21, and they'll be complex conjugates of each other so that the Hamiltonian, and this is a Hamiltonian matrix, that should always have, it must be Hamitian for you know, real eigenvalues. Okay. So this is what's gonna happen, and the, the strength of these will, 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 will tell you how you know, the dynamics of the system looks, whether it's possible for the electron to go from state one to state two or not, and so on. If this, these two terms are zero because of whatever reason, could be because of symmetry, you know, because the S state, the ground state of a hydrogen atom is spherically symmetric, this is p orbitals, you know. Maybe because your perturbation is such that it's not, this matrix element is zero, let's say, right? In which case, it will stay in the stationary state, it will be completely untouched, you know. But if it is, uh, is uh, non-zero, then it'll couple it, right? So that's the idea. Now, what, uh, to be more exact, uh, this perturbation may also lead to what you call as a diagonal shift. It may, you know, kind of a DC shift for all energy. It can move, move this up a little bit. It can move that up a little bit as well. You know, that's the on-site sort of energy changes as well, right? in addition to the hopping terms, if you might. So it's, okay, I just I added two more terms. So this is, these energies are on-site energies, right? if you want to think of it this way. And if you think of going from here to there, that's a hopping term, if, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and those can be perturbed from external forces now. So that's what we, now, uh, I'm not going to try to solve this, but uh, this is a couple differential equation. And you can actually, this is, uh, I think maybe one of the two problems in time-dependent perturbation that's exactly solvable. Everything else needs the golden rule approximation we're going to do. Okay? But this is exactly solvable, uh, and you can write down the two equations and, and then uh, uh, find out how C2 and C1 evolve with time completely. You know? And uh, so C1 squared will oscillate as one minus something times sine squared, a certain frequency. And this frequency is, uh, uh, called the Rabi oscillation frequency, or you know, uh, that uh, is dependent on 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 the perturbation. Uh, so it's, so omega is dependent on the perturbation term, and delta omega is the energy difference or the frequency difference between the two states. Okay. 
<coughs> so, uh, so essentially what he's saying is your state that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, th th if the electron was in this state, then with time, depending on the perturbation strength, it will reduce, go back up, reduce, go back up, and come back to one, you know. So it will oscillate. The probability of finding it in state one or state two is going to oscillate. The sum will always be one because there's only one electron in this two-level two system, but it will oscillate with time. So, and uh, uh, and you can you can uh, uh, okay. So now this is actually extremely useful for um, things. I mean, a lot of metrology things, you know, measurement of uh, time periods of things. But uh, especially today, it's useful for quantum computation. So this is your qubit. You know, this is a uh, where you create uh, a two-level system, and you have all possible states in between them, which are superpositions accessible to you at any point of time. You know, if you, if you want 30% of this and 70% of that, you can sample it at this time, and that state is available. You know, all, all the quantum superpositions are available to you. Okay. And uh, one of the challenges is, uh, uh, so this is a fully dissipationless system. What is going on here is the electron is absorbing some energy from the excitation and then it's releasing it. You know, it's absorbing, releasing it, and so on. That's how it's going back. So it's oscillating because maybe it's absorbing a photon, then it's releasing it, absorbing a photon, and releasing it, and so on. It exchanges energy with the surroundings. You know. And uh, one of the way these qubits are made today are uh, using microwave waveguides. So you actually have a photon in an electromagnetic waveguide on the chip, and then there's a two-level system typically made of superconductors and this is how you create the qubit. So what we talked earlier is a ballistic transistor. That creates a bit between 0 and 1. You know. uh, and that's a collective thing where there are 10 to the power 12 per centimeter square electrons, so a collective single particle effect. This is also single particle effect, but this is a collective thing because now you cannot, if you are here, you don't know which uh, state. I mean, it's a, it's a mixed state now, so, uh, but you are controlling it in a very nice way. Okay. Okay, so there are many other things about it you can, one can talk about, uh, uh, but I want to kind of say that the big problem with this now, it, and big problem with qubits today, is it doesn't live too long. You know, it, 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 what will happen is, if I actually do the measurements, uh, this system is, so you want it to stay, you know, maybe like that, and then like that. That's the ideal situation. But what happens is uh, uh, the probability is going to actually, there'll be a finite decay with time. And it's going to decay with time as e to the power, well, t over some tau. This is some time constant. And, and, uh, and, and that, that primarily happens because it gets coupled to all the other states which we have not considered, we have neglected. There are all these other states that we have not considered yet, right? It gets coupled to those other states as well. And that's a decoherence time or dephasing time, and that limits some of the uh, qubits today. Yeah. We are actually going to start with this one. You know, uh, why does it decohere? How long does it take? That's right. That's the golden rule. Sort of tells you that how long will it survive? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, as uh, as an uh, uh, example, just as a very quick example, if I had a hydrogen atom and uh, uh, by the way, just coming back, this potential here, it could also be time dependent. I, I've said earlier that it uh, uh, is time independent, it just depends on space. But if it is time dependent and it's monochromatic, meaning it has one frequency, then you can also solve it exactly. And, and then uh, uh, you'll get absorption and emissions processes and that such things here. And uh, typically I would say that uh, the hydrogen atom, if you place it in an excited state, if the electron is here and you uh, try to find how long will it stay there, uh, it takes about one nanosecond for a hydrogen atom, the first excited state. It will fall here and it will emit a photon. And that's because it's coupled to the photon and we have, uh, we're going to talk about that now. Yeah. You mentioned that this is one of the only solvable, um, analytically solvable cases. Yes. Were you referring to the fact that it's a two-level system, or that your electric field is of some form? No, no. I, I, you know, the, the electric field profile could be any complicated function you want. Okay. But uh, the two-level system, 
uh, is is solvable in general. You know? uh, but we are. And that's what you were suggesting. The yeah. 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 Right. Right. So, uh, and it's always uh, you know because it's solvable. You you have a complete knowledge of what to expect, and so that's why people are able to use it and use it to design things and that sort of thing. Now, you know, for qubits. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Okay. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, when you say that you have another extra W11 and W22, right? Yeah. Do you mean like, let's say if you have the perturbation, let's say it's a constant electric field or something. Yeah. So uh, at infinite time or something, these energies will have different eigenvalues. Yeah. And that those eigenvalues are the extra. Exactly. So, I mean, a very uh, quick example of that is let's say your hydrogen atom physically is at this point in space, and then you have your constant electric field across. And uh, because of constant electric field, your potential is, you know, uh, f times x, let's say. There's sine, and we can take care of that. And the s orbital is, you know, has a certain extent like that, right, uh, of one hydrogen bore radius. Then uh, the E1, which is the energy, will shift very, very crude approximation by, you know, if this is your bore radius, you know, then the E1 will shift, because you can see it, going from here to there, I have a potential drop of four, uh, the field times the Bohr radius. So it'll just shift a little bit. But that's a DC shift. That's not changing any, you know. Thing. It's actually also going to kind of, classically you can imagine if the force is that way, the electron will get pushed a little bit. So it will deform the wave function to a little bit from spherically symmetric, and that sort of thing. But that's a DC shift. No. And uh, right, so essentially we're saying, just like in a transistor, we were when we apply a voltage, we can move the whole band, right, uh, up or down. It's exactly the same thing here. You know, if you, with the gate, with the gate voltage, you can, in a transistor, move the whole thing up or down, right? And in the, in the same way, this is the DC shift. There, okay. But now, what we are asking the question is, what happens internally within the band or between these microscopic states? You know, after you have done the DC shift, you know, what happens internally? And these are the coupling terms that will play a role. Okay, okay so let's uh, set this problem up. Uh, and you know, just as a qualitative picture, uh, again, trying to connect to where uh, we are. Uh, if I had a completely perfect crystal, right, uh, which no, has, uh, I do not allow for phonon scattering or anything like that, then I know I have a certain lattice constant, right? Uh, in a perfectly periodic crystal, I'm moving from atoms to crystal for a, for a moment, uh, and so I have a lattice of you know atoms and, and the basis associated with it. And let's say lattice constant is A, and then the electron wave is supposed to go through this whole periodic potential. Uh, and and if the lattice constant is A, we have a reciprocal lattice vectors that look like two pi over A, right? Uh, plus pi by a, minus pi by a, so they're separated by two pi by a. So you can imagine there, because of this, you know, arrangement of atoms. Uh, uh, one way to look at it is the electron wavelength when it becomes uh, of, you know, if two pi by the wavelength of the electron becomes of this order, will start interfering very strongly. Right? Another way to say that is the crystal, because of its location of the atoms, is a, you know, essentially a, it can kick the electrons around with a very specified, you know, uh, K. Does that make sense? I mean, because the crystal has a, this is why it's called the crystal momentum, you know, so, so G, uh, or, you know, the electron that will interact, the electron K that will interact. So the elect uh, crystal has a lot of strength at these K, K points because of the arrangement of the atoms, periodic crystal. And that's why all your, you know, violent things that happen to the band structure, like opening of band gaps and all that, you know, evanescent states happen at these points. Right? You know, deformation. Far away from it, the, you know, the electron and crystal don't interact much because the crystal doesn't have that potential to provide to the electron or change its momentum and all that. Now, uh, uh, if I have, uh, you know, so maybe an, so the electron as a result can scatter from state K to K plus G or K minus G, you know, which are these things, but it cannot go anywhere intermediate. And these scattering events is what causes the band gap opening, effective mass, all that stuff. You know, that, that, that's what it does in the end. And after everything is done, that's what happens. Instead of a free electron, you get you know, the bands and, and the gaps, et cetera. Now, uh, uh, so now, uh, let's say instead of one lattice constant, I have a 
you know, slightly different crystal. Well, every crystal one can have. Maybe I have a interpenetrating uh, crystals of two kinds. They have two different lattice constants or something like that. You know? Then you can see that if there are two lattice constants, there'll be two G vectors, yeah. right? And then you'll have strength in more points in K space now. And then the electron can scatter to more points. Now, now, going from here to here, what I'm doing is, you see here, I'm saying the crystal potential is continuous. It's not discrete anymore. And continuous happens when you have what you call disorder. You know, when, when the atoms, maybe, you know, this thing is missing. Right? This atom is missing. That's a vacancy, for example. It's a defect. If I, if I do that, you know, and then there's a defect here, the next defect may be somewhere which is completely uncorrelated with this. It, 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 it may not, the defects may not form a periodic crystal. It may be randomly oriented. You know? And if there's a random function, uh, I think you know that if I have a periodic function and I take a Fourier series, that's exactly what happens when you go to K space. You have, you know, very sharp strength in, in K. Right? If, if in, in real space it looks periodic, it looks like that. If in real space it looks, you know, very random, no correlation between this x and that x, in, 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 uh, in momentum space it will spread out. Right? Uh, so, and if you have, uh, uh, so if you have on the extreme limit, if you have a delta function here in momentum space, it's completely spread out. Because delta function has no periodicity, uh, just one delta function, no periodicity, right? So, so the defects, what they then allow is because it has strength at all k's, if it's randomized, if it's you know, randomly located in the crystal and the potential is non-periodic, then an electron sitting here, you open up the channels for it to go this k, that k, it is allowed to scatter to all k's now. Right? Right? So that immediately opens up the possibility of scattering. So that's why defects will dephase uh, the electronic states and will yeah, you know, uh, so in reality, then this is really not an exact eigenstate anymore because because of the presence of defects, it can leak out to all these other states, and that's really the scattering. And the Fermi Golden Rule is going to tell us exactly how long it's going to stay here before it ends up somewhere else. You know, so, so that's that's yeah. This question. Yeah, so, so with this external potential, let's say, for example, something let's say like a femtosecond laser pulse, but in, in that regard, the time between the pulses is too small. Actual like, relaxation occurs that actually affect the coupling. I see. The you yeah. So uh, no, that's a good point. Uh, so that is a time domain thing. So you can come in with a time domain pulse too. Uh, you know, a femtosecond pulse laser is going to basically hit the electron system in the crystal with a very short, right, pulse of electromagnetic radiation. But this is in time domain, not in real space. I mean. Also in space, it's, it's propagating as a light wave. But uh, so that will lead to a uh, certain range of frequencies of electrons it can interact with and that sort of thing. Here, what I'm talking about, though, is there is a correlation there. It's, you know, it's one can, uh, um, so, so a femtosecond laser pulse also has a pulse width in real space, too, right? And, and so uh, one can um, treat. So actually, all femtosecond laser pulse interaction with matter is treated using this technique as well. So what are we are talking about. So you can either have a defect in real space or in time domain or something like that. So when we look at the phonon, we'll see that the phonon defect state is actually not localized in space. It's obviously a wave, but it's oscillating in time. We'll see that too. So, so we'll combine both of them and see how, how the interaction occurs. If you're asking whether a laser pulse interaction can be treated in this picture, yes, absolutely. This is picture. Okay, so uh, uh, and then uh, from for this part for the next part, I have written this uh, this thing up in that chapter I mentioned. So please uh, refer to that. And what we'll uh, do is is solve the problem in its generality. And I'll just write down the you know, answer first and then we get there. So if I were to scatter from, say, state zero of a quantum system where, OK, so let's say this is state zero with energy E0. And here's a state n with energy En. This is just a schematic. This could be below it, above it, doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, what I want to find is if I put an electron here, time t is equal to zero, and I turn on a perturbation w, how long does it? take before you end up there, let's say, for example. 
And, and uh, so 0 to n uh, will look like this. It will be 2 pi over Planck's constant. And then you will have a matrix element between the original state and the final state. And then whatever is the perturbation is going to sit in the middle. Okay? And then you take the magnitude of that thing, this matrix element, squared. And we will get a, a energy conservation equation here, En minus E0. So, so this is one formula we're going to end up with now. So this is the end result of the golden rule, uh, Fermi golden rule. It says the rate, rate of scattering, 1 over tau, tau is the time, to go from 0 to state n, is 2 pi over h bar times this matrix element squared times uh, energy conserving delta function. So this is a Dirac delta function with units of 1 over energy or 1 over joule. En minus E0 is the energy separation. Oh, 1 over joule or 1 over EV. This is energy squared. Potential is always energy, so that's joule squared. 1 over Planck's constant is 1 over joules times second. So you can see that you get 1 over second or time constant. Simple, okay. So this, is, this result will be true if you have a time independent perturbation. But that's not the only thing we're interested in. We are also interested in perturbations that oscillate in time, especially photons and phonons. Phonons and photons are manifestly, they're waves, so there's time dependence to them. So they may look like uh, you know, something like that. Right? So there may be time dependences in them. If you have that, then the golden rule looks very similar, just slightly different. Uh, you know, 0 to n will be same thing, 2 pi by h bar. Again, the matrix element squared. And now, uh, this energy conservation term, if you might, if you have photons or phonons, will allow for En minus E0, I can write it this way, minus. Uh, say plus h bar omega naught, where omega naught is the frequency of oscillation of the perturbation, and uh, plus e n minus e zero minus h bar omega naught. So from this picture, you can see e zero is the let's say for an initial state. It absorbs a quantum of energy, h bar omega, and goes there. So that's a phon let me photon or phonon absorption, and this one. E0 minus, so maybe E0 is above, it emits. So this is a absorption process, and this is an emission process. So we will cut in all, the, all this stuff will just come out of this. Derivation. Okay. But those are the two major final results of this expression. Uh, uh, Andrew, you have a question here? Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, OK, uh, I, le let me just uh, go over to here. Right. So, so this is the result for for uh, uh, time independent perturbation, and this is the result for time dependent perturbation. So, okay. okay, so uh, now there's a Dirac delta and all that, and that's primarily for energy conservation. We will see how to deal with that. You know, it, mathematically it blows up, but physically, it, you know, it, it's going to give us a very reasonable and sound answer. You know, when, because we're going to sum it over all states, and then the Dirac delta actually is your friend after that because it simplifies the integrals and all that. OK, so uh, let's look at this problem. And uh, I'm pretty much going to discuss this from what's written in this uh, situation. So uh, the way the problem is uh, going to be solved, I'm going to just erase that. Uh, or rather, we will solve, the way we will solve the problem is also make some uh, preparation for things we're going to talk later, which have to do with you know, correlated or many particles sort of thing. So we're going to treat it from that perspective first. So here's, here's the uh, uh, procedure or the way to think about it. Uh, so I have, uh, before the perturbation, I turn on the perturbation, I have a state, uh, I have a situation where the electron is allowed to have many states. Now, how do I connect it with a semiconductor or a crystal or a topological insulator, which, whatever you choose, is you know, all these EK allowed states are these states. That, that's all there is to it, right? I mean, this, this, this could be the states of the band structure of a semiconductor or crystal, uh, or the Dirac, near the Dirac point of graphene, or something like that. But any allowed states of a system, right, of the electron. And, 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 and so uh, the ground state is 0 uh, with energy E0, E1, E2, and let's say this is state n. 
and with the energy E n. Right? And before I before we go ahead and uh, apply the perturbation, let's write down the 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 the, the you know problem that uh, we have. Uh, uh, so the electron sitting in the ground state. Remember when I say it's a ground state. It could be any state. You could start here and then solve the problem all over again, right? I mean, this, this really doesn't have to be the ground state. You're just saying for simplicity at this point. Yeah. If you want from state five to n, no problem. You, you just choose five as your initial state. But uh, what I want to start with is write down the time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, in this f fashion. And I'm going to introduce a little bit of formalism initially because that will help quite a bit later on in the course. And it also helps uh, the, the understanding at this point of time, too. So here's my uh, original uh, situation. This electron is experiencing a periodic potential of the crystal. All that stuff is buried inside H0. That's the original Hamiltonian, right? No perturbation yet. And because you have solved that, you have already determined all your eigenstates. You have determined all your eigenvalues, and the electron just happens to be sitting in the original state here. That's the starting point of this problem. Okay? And uh, I think you know that if I look at this state, uh, zero, labeled as zero, then uh, uh, I, 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 so when I write psi with a subscript of t, uh, uh, OK, l let me uh, write it. So th this has a very uh, uh, trivial solution for that state, right? Because I can write uh, that at psi uh, for the ground state when the wave function psi t is only composed of this one and there's no weight anywhere else. All the other coefficients c2, c3, cn are zero, right? So there's no weight anywhere else. So this, uh, the way you kind of think about solving it is, is you, well, take dt over there and take psi over here. And you know that it's an eigenstate, so you can apply this to the eigenstate if it's the wave function of state 0, right, of, of the, I, this state. When it acts, this Hamiltonian operator acts on this, it'll just give you the energy of that eigenstate, right? So, so what you get is really uh, uh, psi sub t is, uh, I, I think you can see, I, I'm, I'm not trying to do this here, but the solution to this is E naught t times uh, does that make sense what I just wrote? So if you know uh, its state in time t is equal to 0, uh, maybe I should write it down once. So, so uh, this will become del psi t is, I'm, I'm just saying that, well, I, I uh, know my, I, can, I know the state is in, in the ground state, and the electron is in the ground state, so I've already applied the Hamiltonian. This is an operator, but this is a number. Right? So, so it's, now, now you can solve this, and, and you get, you know, and you integrate it, take the dt over there, take the state over here, right? Integrate both sides from time t naught to t, t naught to t. Right? Does that make sense? And you get that, right? So uh, I, uh, just note that I've written it slightly differently. I did a subscript here, and I wrote it as a function here. As a function here. And then I wanted to kind of emphasize there's a slight difference. One is called a Schrodinger picture of the state vector. This is called the Heisenberg picture of the state vector. Slightly different pictures, yeah. So uh, good question. We haven't turned on the perturbation at all. This is just the you know unperturbed problem first. So what we are going to do is, uh, so you can see now e naught over h bar. If I look at the state as a vector, you know, imagine this is a vector of the ground state, right? Maybe you know the ground state vector uh, in the Hilbert space. Uh, so it has a constant part which is not varying with time, but it has this phase factor that's you know rotating in time with a frequency of e naught by h bar, which is a frequency, I mean, yeah, e naught by h bar is certain frequency. So this vector is, you can imagine that it's rotating in time with a frequency omega naught, right? It's, it's a, with a phase factor, right? Its amplitude mod square is not changing with time. It's a stationary state, but the thing is actually rotating. The, the, so the, its intensity is not changing, its probability is not changing, but the amplitude is, right? right? because of this phase factor. And that's the picture that's drawn here, that uh, the state 
is you know, rotating at a certain frequency. You go to higher states, all of them have the same thing. This one is rotating even faster because its frequency is larger, its energy is larger. And so, so they're all kind of moving at different speeds, uh, these vectors. You know. And uh, that's a bit unfortunate because you want to do time-dependent perturbation theory, but even when you don't have any perturbation, these things are changing in time, right? So we want to kind of, uh, what you can do, and this is the Heisenberg picture where you can do a little transformation mathematically that will freeze it. You know, it will it'll take you to another representation of the state vectors in which nothing rotates in time anymore. And then we apply our perturbation on it. And that makes it a little simpler. And that transformation is, uh, 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 that, you know, okay. So, so that transformation happens to be uh, that, uh, I, I think it will kind of becomes evident from here. Uh, here. Here's what we're going to do. Instead of the energy here, uh, we are going to write our uh, state vector, uh, um, we are going to write with a Hamiltonian operator, you know, Hamiltonian operator over here. You know. so, so that's the uh, little transformation we're going to do. Uh, remember, you don't have to do this. Uh, you can solve the entire problem without doing this business, what we're doing now. But it makes it much easier, especially for later stuff we want to cover too. You know, so. so here's a little transformation we're doing. Remember, this is not energy eigenvalue, this is the Hamiltonian operator. So it's actually a matrix, it's sitting in the exponent. You know e to the power of matrix now, so, so that's where it's sitting here. And uh, the trick with this sort of picture is whenever you have a matrix in the exponent, matrix is an analog of a number except the only difference is it doesn't commute. So if you have one after the other, you have to make sure that you keep them in order. You know, that's all there is to it, so the, right? So this is a little transformation we do and we come back to our Schrodinger equation again here. Okay, and now I'm going to solve the problem in its full uh, thing where I'm going to say I have the original Hamiltonian plus any perturbation, which is time dependent. I can have even time varying perturbation. And I'll try to solve this problem now. Right. This is your full blown time dependent Schrodinger equation. And presumably if you are able to solve it and find what happens, you know, what are the solutions of psi in the future time, you have all the answers you need, you know, if you find the wave functions and eigenvalues, all that stuff, then uh, uh, you're again done, right, uh, with the perturbation problem. So, so, uh, so we take this, this form and just plop it in into this equation on two sides, okay. Just to be very clear again, uh, you know, make sure, yeah, I mean, I just want to emphasize this, with the subscript and this, there are different things. They're connected to this transformation. And this is a unitary transformation. What does that mean? You know, well, you can see that absolute value of this is still one, you know, uh, right? Absolute, you know, e to the power i times whatever is still one, and it doesn't change the length of that vector. That's what we mean to say, right? The vector is still the same length, right? <coughs> okay, so, uh, so if you plot that in here, uh, we are going to get uh, i h bar, and then we're going to take derivative, but there are two time terms. There's this time term, because time is sitting here, there's this time term, this time sitting there, right? So we have a, you know, we have to take it uh, uh, one at a time, and so uh, when we take the derivative of the exponent, just like with numbers, uh, what the, you know, we are taking a time derivative, e to the power a t, right? It will plop the a out. Right? Just like that in a matrix, it will pull the matrix down to you know, the whole thing. It will come down when you take a time derivative. So, so you will get minus i over h bar. And then the whole Hamiltonian matrix will come over here. Uh, and, and then it will leave the rest as, as it is. Okay. And here I get the time dependence in the part. That's the first derivative term. Is that here? I'm mean, just you know, working through it. And, and the second term would be, you don't, the derivative goes through and acts on just that one. No. Right, so that's your left-hand side. Right? And the right-hand side, uh, what I have is, I have the Hamiltonian operator, original Hamiltonian unperturbed, and then I, I again write out this Heisenberg form in its you know, Schrodinger version now. 
H bar T. Sometimes called interaction picture. Anyway, I, I don't want to get confused with the names. It's not very important. It's clear what we are doing. Uh, OK, so H0 times that plus these perturbation terms times that. OK, so, so now what you can see here is, uh, you know, let's take the I H bar in. And you have H bar and H bar cancel for this. So you get a I H bar here. And, uh, uh, and then there was an I times I, so that minus I. So that's, I think the word is I for an I, right? So one, right? Uh, uh, so, so now, uh, uh, OK, so, so you get this sort of uh, picture here. And uh, you see why we did this is because uh, you get this, you know, uh, just to make sure, yeah. So you see that this whole thing just goes, right? It cancels this whole thing out. Right, this whole term, uh, okay, on both sides cancels up, right. and you uh, you end up with a what looks at least at the face value to be a much simpler form of the time dependence Schrodinger equation in, in this new format. There's one little glitch. I mean, I, I have this exp e to the power of Hamiltonian matrix sitting on this side. I want to actually take it to the right side because what I want to do, uh, let's you know. Uh, I'll just write it that way. I, uh, I, I'll treat it as a number and uh, oh, dt. So I'll take this to the right side. If it is a number, it's no problem. e to the power minus a here, e to the power plus a here, right? You take it to that side. If it's a matrix, uh, if you are comfortable with it, then there's no problem either. You know? uh, but uh, if it's a matrix, e to the power, any matrix times e to the power minus that matrix is identity matrix as long as the matrix has you know, non-zero eigenvalues, right? I mean, it doesn't blow. Basically, what you're going to, so, e to the, so it, if it is a, you know, like i times pi, where e to the power, that thing goes to zero, then you'll have a problem. But you know, this is a, these are all Hermitian matrices. They're well behaved. So you can write that, uh, you, know, you can always take it to the right side because of this identity. Does that make sense? I mean, the matrix should not be a problem as long as it is a well-behaved matrix. And it is a well-behaved, it's a Hamiltonian matrix. So as a result, I have this very nice form now. Uh, uh, so I get e to the power plus i over h bar h naught t. You know. And your equation now looks very interesting. Uh, it, it, it looks like, uh, you know, I'm just rewriting it here. Plus i over h bar Hamiltonian t times your perturbation term times e to the power minus i over h bar t. This whole thing acting on your state, right? So this is your uh, a modified time dependence Schrodinger equation. We really have done nothing new. We just have gone into a new space. But if you look at it now, if you have no perturbation, if you pull that out, uh, pull that term out, then on the right side, right hand side, you have zero, right? And that means your this state in this new, new uh, you know, state that we have defined, with time, if you don't have any perturbation yet, it's not changing, it's just frozen, right? Because d over dt is zero. There's no, we have basically absorbed the phase factor out of it. You know, that's, that's what we have done in this, phase, in this space. Uh, state vectors do not rotate in time, they stay put. And we are going to apply the perturbation on this, on this, uh, on this state, rather than on the original state, which was already oscillating. But what we have is definitely a little bit of a different beast here because these two are, are matrices or operators now. They're sitting in the exponents. And we'll see actually it's extremely useful to have it there because we'll see it will <coughs> cause a lot of simplifications as we move along now. It's a, OK. So now uh, um, uh, uh, what we want to, we want to go back and answer our question we started with that uh, if I put the state in you know, if, if you have time t is equal to zero, I have put it in this state, where is it at time t, you know, future time, right? That's what I want to answer. And then I'll, I'll start from here and try to solve this problem now. And solving the problem, at least, you know, at, at a level of uh, uh, formally, it's trivial, you, you have to integrate this thing, right, uh, on both sides and, and find out what is the psi of t at any future time. 
from now. And uh, let's write that down and see uh, what it le leads to. Uh, <coughs> okay. So here's the uh, starting point then for really doing the perturbation, time dependent perturbation theory. And uh, what I want to do is uh, find out what is my w uh, state of the system in this representation at any time t. And now I have uh, i over h bar Hamiltonian t. In fact, let's let's make it even simpler. Let's call this whole thing as w of t. You know, I mean, I, with no confusion. I mean, this is the notation we're using. The whole thing is w of t. Remember, there are all these cascade of matrices in there, but uh, okay. So how do you solve it? If you want to find psi at any time t, uh, again, we do the same business. We, we uh, uh, you know, uh, psi of t. We can take the i h bar to this side, 1 over i h bar, and write. OK. But uh, now time is a variable. Let's. Uh, draw the axis here, and this is t zero. Some it could be zero, could be any value, but this is the original time. That's or, or some time, and and uh, your perturbation is changing in a certain way with time. And we are going to integrate it from here to a certain time t, you know, and find out what's the state of the system here. Right? From time t is equal to t zero to time t. Okay. Uh, same thing here. I'm going to integrate it. I take the dt here. Or, but inside the integral, I just want to be sure I just put a prime here because that's varying. T, t prime is going from here to there. Right? So does that make sense? I mean, I, just keeping everything, you know, bookkeeping correctly. So, uh, so that's what we want to find. And so I, I, you know, this is the exact differential. So all you get on the left side is the state vector at time t, which is what we want, minus the state vector at the original time, right? On the left side, it's the exact differential. Right? So on the right side, we have an integral, uh, uh, which uh, is, uh, you know, yeah, one over i h bar. This whole thing, I'm, I, I don't want to write it all out, but uh, d t prime. You know, w of t prime times the state at t prime. Okay. So I can uh, think of it as as the following. I take this to the right side. The state vector here is this plus that. Right. Right. So now, physically, you can see what happened is you know this was your original state vector. Maybe it was pointing in that direction at time t0, right? And because of this perturbation, maybe it has rotated a little bit. You know, the vector has changed. And this term is, is that vector. You might think. Does that make sense? I mean, just pictorially. I mean, not, nothing physically, right? It's just changed it. And if you don't have the perturbation, it's still 0, right? Now, it looks like it is solved analytically for all cases, right? But in reality, you have really not solved it. And why is that? Yeah, yeah, because what you don't know, what you want is also sitting inside here now, right? So, right? so you see that here, right? So it's sitting there too. So what you do, you can uh, rewrite it now and say, well, let's look at it. I, I know the expression for it. I can write the whole thing again, right? Do you know what I mean? So it's a recursive relation now, right? And this is why the time-dependent perturbation theory remains unsolved. Pro I mean, it's not analytically solvable. That's what we mean. It's, it's a recursive problem. It depends on itself. And so now we say that, well, that, that, that is, in that case, it is going to be psi at t0 plus this whole thing all over again, 1 over i h bar. But we have to be a little careful now, because when we integrate this vector, which is physically this vector here, we have to make sure that the time we are integrating it over is less than t prime. Do you know what I mean? Uh, OK, let me write that down. So I'm going to have dt double prime now. It's a new time variable. And that will be w of t double prime 
times psi of t double prime. Okay, so this time ordering is kind of important because, you know, I have another time variable now which I want to integrate, but that thing should be less than this because that's sitting inside an integral that only goes till t prime. Do you know what I mean? So, so, yeah. So, so this is still exact, but we still don't know this, right? So you kind of keep going. So they can go to many, many higher orders. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is a series solution. And here's the, uh, what I'll try to say initially and then we take it from this. So if the solution is such, if the perturbation is weaker than the Hamiltonian in magnitude, meaning if the, this is, let's say the Hamiltonian electron, the original Hamiltonian, unperturbed Hamiltonian electron, the electron is seeing potentials that are changing by 10 electron volts. Whereas this one, maybe it's a phonon, which is 20 milli electron volts, in which case it's small. Right? If it's small, then as you take square of it, you know, it's essentially, uh, let me rewrite this a little bit again in a slightly different way. So I break this up bracket into, D naught, okay, so that's the second term plus then you get us uh, yeah it, you know in in uh, when I actually write it out in detail, it looks a little messier, but okay, so what you get here is a term which is unperturbed, this is perturbation to the power zero. Oh, term that is first order, uh, sorry, first order, W to the power, perturbation to the power one. Another term which is perturbation to the power two. This is that and so on, the higher order perturbation terms. Physically what is going on is the electron initially, in this case it just goes through, doesn't see the perturbation. In this case, you know, the, uh, in this case, the electron goes through and gets hit by the perturbation once. This case, it goes through, scatters once, maybe scatters one more time, D double scattering th three times and so on. So, so physically, that's what's going on here. We'll talk about those parts later, but uh, the claim is uh, for weak scattering events, the higher order terms get successively smaller and smaller. You know, and the weak, by weak, I mean the energy scale of the perturbation may be 10 MeV versus 10 EV. Now that's a weak term, for example. Even when you square it, yeah. Uh, the last integral that you mean should go to T double prime equals T prime. Is that right? T double prime. Oh, you know, you're right. You're right. Absolutely right. T zero to yeah. T prime, then uh, T prime will go. Yeah, this will go from T zero to T. Yeah, yeah that's the whole thing. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So, so this is the whole series. And uh, what we are going to, for, the, for getting the first result of Fermi golden rule, you can throw out everything higher than the second order term. Just throw everything out. Say, well, they're small. So you neglect those. And then you can get uh, the result I wrote initially for Fermi golden rule by just retaining these two terms. So it will give you that, that result. And uh, since we are at it, let me just finish it. We are uh, you know, running a little late in time, but uh, we'll just finish this up. Okay. So, uh, okay, in this picture, we are here, we said we, it's not an equality, it's an approximation. We are saying that psi t is equal to the original state vector plus this first order interaction term, just the first order. Right? So we throw all these things out. We have to be a little careful in certain cases, you can actually cook up and really experimentally find situations when this term is actually zero. You know? And then you have to go to the second term or third term. You can, you know, but but most cases it's it's actually finite. So, okay. So if that, if that's so, uh, remember our our major question really is uh, if I start at this state, and uh, you know how long does it take or how you know for me if I'm if I have a detector that's detecting electrons in this state I'm sitting there and waiting. The question is how long will it take after I turn on the perturbation? for an electron to appear here. I mean, that's the idea, or a scattering rate, right? So, so that's what we're after. And how do you find that? You, you know that your original, uh, so what you would need is what is the coefficient of the nth state at time t, right? That's what we are after. 
you know, if you write out your expansion of the wave function as a sum of C uh, m t times m, right? This is a combination of this state plus that state plus that state, right? What is the, you know, how does the coefficient for the nth state change with time? That's what we are really after here. Right? And how do you find that? You take, you, you project it on state n, right? the, the whole state on state n, and you will, uh, you know, the only thing left on the right side will be C n of t. You, you just project it. You just find the coefficient, projection of the nth state vector. Uh, the, or, you know, uh, physically what we have is, uh, you know, your, 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 your general state has evolved at time t to something like this, and we are sitting here saying that, well, how much did this, how much of this, is, you know, if I project it, how much of it is here? Does that make sense, the length of that? And, and that mathematically is actually very easy because you have already an expression for this whole state vector. And, well, okay, so all, all we need to do is project it on state n, and you get C n of t, right? And, and so state n, and state n, we project the whole thing on state n. Okay, now, if your original state uh, was psi at t is equal to zero, it was in the ground state, t is equal to zero, so this thing is zero, state zero, right? right. It's zero. It could be anywhere, could be state three, state five, whatever be it. Could be at the bottom of the band, could be halfway up in the band, whatever, right? but it's some state, right? So, so it's, it's state zero, it's zero. Okay, so now uh, you see right away that this thing, if you have or, or originally already you know, normalized your states, these are orthogonal, zero and n. So that goes away, right? Does it make sense? State zero, eigenstate zero and eigenstate n are perpendicular orthogonal states, that thing is just zero. So just left with that. And now uh, what I have to do is take, so I have a one over i h bar, and this state vector n, I, uh, I'm gonna claim that I can slide it across dt, because state vector lives in Hilbert space, it doesn't care about time, it commutes with time. So you pull it in here, so I write it n here. Right? Can I move it across w of t? I can't, because I have a Hamiltonian operator sitting here now, so the order matters now. Right? So let's write this whole thing out. What is w of t prime? From here, you can write the whole thing down. It looks like e to the power plus i over h bar Hamiltonian t prime. Uh, w e to the power minus i over h bar t prime. And acting on state zero on the right side. So that's your expression for the coefficient at time t, and you're almost uh, there at the answer, but not yet, so, okay. So now what do you do? You look at it carefully and you realize that this is the original unperturbed Hamiltonian, right? Original unperturbed Hamiltonian. And sure, it's a function, this whole thing is a function of the Hamiltonian, it's e to the power of that function, right? But you realize that, you know, if this Hamiltonian acts on this state, you know its eigenvalue, it's E0. You know its original eigenvalue is just that, right? right? So it actually doesn't matter if it's a polynomial function, you can still act on it. Right? And what it will do is it will act on this state and it will convert this matrix into the number, you know, the eigenvalue. It will give you the eigenvalue. Does that make sense what I just said? If I have H0 acting on zero is E0 times zero, then E to the power you know, i over h bar h naught t acting on zero is equal to, essentially this matrix gets converted into a number, e naught t times zero. Any function of it will also give you this. So that's nice. And on the left side, this thing will act on the nth state, which is also an eigenvalue, right? So it's also an eigenvalue. So what happens then is these two exponents, instead of being matrices, become numbers now, and uh, that, that pretty much kind of solves your problem for you. So it looks like that now. Okay, so uh, I, I just want to say that uh, we are a little out of time, but this from here uh, to the uh, golden rule equation is uh, basically uh, two steps. 
uh, and I don't, uh, I, I don't have time today, but we'll talk about that tomorrow in the you know, uh, 5 p.m. class. But uh, uh, right, so, so once you go through that, this and this, take care of that. And in a couple of steps from here, you end up with the, uh, with the, with the golden rule result. You know? So, so uh, that, that you will get the Dirac delta sort of figure. And we'll do that in the, you know, in, in, in the, at 5 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, so, so, and then we start applying it to a various situations. Yeah. Okay, I'm spending a little time, more time on the derivation again here because uh, we are going to use it, uh, use this formalism later for a few other things. You know, so, so I just, okay, good. So again, and please collect your first assignments and uh, uh, yeah, I think all of you have turned in your second. Okay.